Welcome, welcome back to Karen's Couch. And here we are, still counting down your three top shows, your most favorite episodes of Karen's Couch. And this week, you get the pleasure of watching your number two most popular show. Sit back and relax, enjoy. Welcome to the couch. Welcome back. And I'm so excited that you're still tuning in and hearing some of the amazing information that we're sharing with you. Now today, today's a really, um, it's a real personal show for me actually, because probably about two or three years ago, I started to put two and two together and I realized that I was an emotional eater or I am an emotional eater. You know, I found myself saying, hi, my name's Karen Smith and I haven't had chocolate in 20 minutes purely because every time I felt an emotion, whether it was happy or sad or bored or I wanted to reward myself or I was frightened or I was depressed, I would eat. I would find myself with this, this uncontrollable desire to fill my belly, whether I was hungry or I wasn't. And I started to put it together that I was an emotional person using food to quell my emotions. So as I do, I went down the rabbit hole, did a whole world of research on what's going on with me and why I eat to support myself. And of course, it goes back to when we were kids and, you know, how I learned to eat. But I'm 44 years old and I reckon that I should be able to sort myself out now rather than having to go back and do all of the childhood regression type of work. What I also discovered was that inside of our guts, there is 80% um, of the body's dopamine is, is generated in our gut. So I'm feeling all of these emotional responses and then I'm going and stuffing in a whole bunch of food and I'm quelling the body's natural response to whatever's going on around me externally. None of this felt like it was in my control. All of it felt like it was all happening to me. I didn't feel like I could... Um, overcome it with willpower. God knows I've tried. And I tell you what, as soon as I started posting some of these questions on Facebook, I know that there was a world of people out there who were exactly the same as me. So it didn't matter what I did. I felt like I couldn't get my, couldn't get a grip on it to make a difference. So what I've decided to do with Karen's Couch today, I've decided to go outside and bring you an expert. So I've done my research, as I said, and I found an amazing woman all the way from California, Jeannie Segal. Now she's absolutely extraordinary in terms of her understanding of emotional intelligence. Why we eat, what is emotional hunger versus physical hunger? She's got a whole bunch of books that she's written, in fact five, on emotional intelligence and how we can find happiness in a world that's completely overstressed. And Jeannie's gonna tell us a little bit about that today. But we're really going to be focusing in on emotional eating because I have had in the last six months, I must have had at least 40 or 50 messages come through social media from people just like you wanting to get their hands on that emotional eating demon that seems to have us by our throat. You know, and I've discovered that there's people in the world who eat for fuel and there's people in the world who eat for emotional reasons. And it's pretty easy to determine which one you are. So join me, join me today as we have a really in-depth, um, amazing conversation with Jeannie Segal. And I want you guys to welcome to the couch, as I mentioned, the beautiful Jeannie Siegel. Welcome Jeannie, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about emotional eating. It's such a huge, huge topic. And you and I have been talking off screen about this. So I'm really, I'm, I'm so excited because I feel like you're going to save my life and the thousands of people's lives that have made inquiries about how we can get to the bottom of it and save, our, save ourselves from the intense desire to eat. It's just, it's, it's quite overwhelming. And viewers, I want to, and our listeners on our podcast, I want to, I want to tell you guys how I actually found Jeannie because I was writing for a particular website on the contrast between people who eat for fuel and people who eat emotionally, because I'd recognized I was one of those, as I've said. 
And I was doing some research um, on the internet and I came across an article that was on a website called helpguide.org, which we're going to put on the page beneath this video so that you guys can refer to it yourselves. But helpguide.org is like, it's, it's a free website and there's a whole raft of information that's so relevant to the art of being human and it's free. So anytime you've got questions about yourself, your own behavior, your life, stress, anything that's not working and anything that is working, helpguide.org. Use it as a research, pop it into your kit bag because you're going to use it as a tool, I promise you. I've been back to helpguide.org at least 10 times since I found Jeannie. Yeah, I was going to say it's a non-profit, no ads on the website, no ads. I think that's what that's what makes it so attractive because it's so easy to find what you want on there. And this is your personal website that you've put together, isn't it, Jeannie? Well, it's a website that we put together in response to people's needs. We had a tragedy in our family. Our daughter committed suicide at 29, and we looked for a way to help people like her. And we thought, you know, she would have used the Internet. Yeah. And yeah. So out of that tragedy came this website that now brings about, I don't know, somewhere between 150, 175,000 viewers every single day. And we've never spent one penny on publicity. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, now you're going to have probably, based on our following, another 20,000 views, probably just after the show. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an interesting story then that's driven you to start putting this information out to the public, Jeannie. Tell us, tell us more about that. What was, you know, tell us about your daughter. Tell us about what's inspired you to become this global resource. Well, she was, she was depressed. Mm. She probably uh, had bipolar and was given medications that were actually at the time counterindicated. Oh. She shouldn't have been given those medications. They created suicidal ideation. You know, all of this information, she could have read this. She could have learned about bipolar disorder. She could have learned more about depression, yeah. anxiety, stress. There are, there's, there's information, good solid information. We, by the way, uh, collaborate with Harvard Medical School. Our information is solid. Everything on there is carefully researched mm. and then written by a team, a face-to-face -face team of mental health professionals and professional writers. Yeah. So it's good information communicated in a way that people can actually do something with it. That's the point of the website. Yeah. This, you know, we have a lot of information, but we can't always do something with the information we have. This information is not only basically solid, at least as solid as we can get at any one point. You know, we're constantly updating and changing depending on what the latest studies tell us. But how do you how, how do you use it? How do you get something out of it? That's our question. And I think the part that's so empowering about this website is that it actually allows the person to um, understand themselves better. It allows them to understand what's going on for themselves so that then they can start to make more informed decisions for themselves as opposed to being at the mercy of somebody else's diagnosis, if you like. It helps, it helps a person to um, really to understand better. And the way that it's written is, is just, you know, I'm looking at this and it's just it's written in a way that's in layman's terms. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Really, you should be congratulated about that. Right. And when people can do any... So we've lost our connection with Jeannie now. I was going to say that what the website really focuses on is stress, which we now know is probably the source of just about any problem you've got. Yeah, And it really takes us back to emotional eating because the source of most, I would pr perhaps all emotional eating is more stress than we can handle. I would agree with you. 
I would agree with you on that. Let's let's talk about the emotional eating um, and your wealth of knowledge on it. Why? Where does it start? Why do we eat emotionally? Why do we do that? What's wrong with us that we do that? First of all, there's nothing wrong with us. We have a nervous system that can be calmed and soothed by various sensory stimulations, okay? We can listen to music that feels good. We can touch things that feel good and immediately feel better. One of the ways that one of the ways that we are affected by our senses, there's a sense of taste. And from the time we're tiny babies, yeah. we yeah. learn that through that sense, we can become calm, focused, soothed. And so that sense is what we tend to rely on, especially if we don't do one of two things. If we don't have a lot of people in our lives that we can go to and who will listen to us and you know, we can talk our hearts out to when they'll be, they won't judge us and they won't give us advice. So just listen. We don't have enough of those people, most of us. And yeah. the secondary way, the second way that we can come and soothe very quickly and dependently is through the senses. And the sense of eating is one that we, most people just have most practice in and use exclusively. And that's the problem. It's, it's not that it doesn't work. It's that there are other senses that would do the same thing without the negative side effects that are affected, you know, that happen when we eat all the time to calm and soothe. You know, you're actually making a very, uh, a very um, important point, and I'm getting a bit of an aha moment while we're talking here because when I think back to my childhood, I – I'm one of those people in this world who's been incredibly blessed with, you know, the world's most loving, giving, caring parents. And I'm the youngest of three, so I was looked after and cared for by my brother and sister and loved to absolute bits. And I look back at my childhood and I try to figure out from a psychological point of view, where did it go wrong? Like, why did I turn to food when I had so much love around me? But I guess the aha moment that I'm getting here from you is that I'm just so well-practiced at it. I'm so well-practiced at turning to food as opposed to turning to the other senses. And now that I'm older, I find myself myself so soothed and nourished when I smell amazing aromatherapy oils or the scent of a rose or even just lying in the grass. I find the most beautiful sense of connection comes. But I'm most practiced at, at eating chocolate. Hands down. It's fast, it's easy, and you're more practiced at it. You have to get more practiced at listening to certain sounds, feeling certain textures, sometimes movement. Movement can also come. There are a number of ways to calm and soothe very rapidly, very dependably through the senses, and we need to develop a whole repertoire of of, uh, methods that work for us quickly so that we don't have to depend on just one method. Jenny, in your opinion, why is it that we're requiring so much more calming and soothing in the first place? Because what I'm think, also getting is what... I, I think my, my impression is that we're more stressed than ever. We shouldn't be. I mean, in some ways, we're safer, more comfortable. You know, we have a lot more than anybody ever had before us. But on the other hand, we do lots of things that make life even more stressful. Um, in, in my book, in the Feeling Love book, I talk about the fact that, you know, we use this technology. We misuse technology. Technology is a wonderful thing. Yeah. But we, when we overuse it, we add stress to our lives rather than uh, reduce stress. That's one thing. We, we, there are a number of way, things that we do. We We don't stay connected to what we feel. If we stayed connected, if we stayed out of our heads more, if we worried less, we we tend to be big time worriers. And the more you worry, the more anxious you get, the more stressed you get. And so we're always in the then and there thinking about what did happen that we didn't like or what could happen that we might not like. So we, we have a lot of bad habits to take a look at and you know, um, control a little more, you know, put them in their place a little bit better. Isn't that we never should worry and that we shouldn't use technology and that we shouldn't depend on various things that, that 
Um, we shouldn't listen to the loud music ever, that kind of thing. Mm. But we do a lot of things to excess. And what happens is we, we become increasingly stressed and our nervous system, it becomes overloaded. And that's why we need these all, so many of these quick, fast fixes, which are often food related. I'm almost speechless, which is uncommon and unusual for me, because I'm 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 really I'm really paying attention and listening to everything that you're saying, and trying to assimilate it and relate it to my own life. And it's it's there's such truth and such potency in what you're saying because I find um, on a day to day basis when I'm working on the computer, I go through phases of anger, resentment loneliness and boredom, excitement, energized, clarity, intense focus. I've just counted like eight states, eight, eight states of human being just in a day while I'm working on the computer, working on my business. No, that's very normal, Karen. That's, that's, not, that's how we work, that we have that kind of a nervous system that's constantly moving, constantly ch- changing emotions are constantly flowing that's as it should be yeah and yeah. if we have a variety of uh, uh, either people in our lives or or sensory knowledge and understanding we can manage all of that it's it is doable right. but we need yeah. to bring, we, we need to bring a full palette we're sort of like john one note with our senses and and that's what happens with people who overeat there is john one note there's only one way to calm and soothe not many, and we need many, and we need to experiment so that we learn, you know, in in this setting, I can use this method to calm and soothe. In another setting, I can use another method. On the website, and in the book too, I refer to something called the the toolkit, which is a free program that teaches you how to use your senses in this way. It's free, it's online on the Help Guide website. Oh, my goodness, that's amazing because that was going to be my next question to you is where do we start? Because I just I want, to, I want to point out something that you wrote in the article which really resonated for me about how do we identify if we are an emotional eater or using you know, food to, to calm and soothe ourselves. And you said the difference between emotional hunger and physical hunger is actually quite obvious in that emotional hunger comes on suddenly and must be satisfied immediately. As soon as I read that, my eyes like popped out of my head and I thought, this woman, she's in my head, she knows me. Whereas physical hunger, you say, comes on gradually and it can wait and it's open to lots of options that sound good rather than just something sweet or something that's fat-laden, which emotional hunger tends to drive us towards. Um, and you were saying in this article, you said that physical hunger doesn't make us feel bad about ourselves afterwards, after we've eaten, whereas emotional hunger, while the, the, um, the comfort and the soothing is temporary and momentary, the experience afterwards is probably worse. And I certainly know in my case, the experience after I've had that chocolate or that cake or whatever it is that I've eaten is worse. I feel worse about myself than what I did before I ate it. You know, the emotional condition that it leaves me in after I've stuffed myself until I'm sick, it feels worse than what I felt before. So then I need to eat again. Well, you, you feel out of control. Oh, when you yes. when, when you're stressed to the point of almost of overwhelm, yes. that's what happens. What happens is a reflex kicks in. Your nervous system now moves from I'm in control to fight, flight, or freeze. And you need something very quick, very fast, to bring it back into balance. And that's where so so you're acting on the reflex. You're not acting on a sense. You're acting on a, on a reflex, and reflexes come on very fast, and they demand your attention, and they demand that you do something about it. Got to, it's, if, I, if I'm feeling, you know, fight, flight, or freeze, I need a fix right away help. so I can feel better. Help. 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 Help us. <laughs> what do we do? What, what's what's, well, we, yeah, what's we the go, answer? We can... If we can learn, first of all, we need to learn to identify when we are starting to become overwhelmed. Some people get angry, agitated. 
some people space out, some people almost freeze as you start to get better. And, and the program on the website, the toolkit program, helps you to start to learn to identify. It's not hard. It's obvious. Um, and if, and if you, I always say if you ask somebody who knows you well, they'll tell you right away how you respond to stress. <laughs> it's no secret. Yeah, and then once you right. learn, then you start saying, ah, I'm starting to feel I'm, I'm getting overstressed. What can I do? Do I look at these beautiful flowers? Do I, um, you know, maybe jump up and down a little, move a little? I sit in rocking chair. I have rocking chairs all over my house. Because when I rock, when I move like that, back and forth, I, it calms and soothes me. Uh, other people, idea. you know, I, a lot of people have a rocking chair in their office. I, I think that's a good idea. But, you, but it, different people will be affected by different sensory experiences. It's not one size fits all, but it's a fun thing to explore and learn what kinds of sensory input work very rapidly and very well for you. And then you collect a few of them because you need it when you're driving, you need it when you're talking to someone on the phone or face to face. Different settings require, you know, you'll need different things to help you as needed. So it's called the toolkit is the mm -hmm. free program. So to our viewers and also to our podcast listeners, the link to the toolkit is going to be on the bottom of uh, or underneath this video. So make sure that you go and have a look at that because I actually I'm going to I am going to go and have a look at that as soon as we're finished this show. I'm logging straight on and I'm going to save everything. I I I love that what you're suggesting Jeannie is that we we arm ourselves and begin the journey of exploring. And I love that. Begin the journey of explore, exploration. And not waste time telling up how awful we are in our this and that. That is such a waste of time. Self-criticism, in fact, criticism, period. Uh, blaming, criticism, judgments, such a waste of energy and time. Better to take that same energy and learn some new skills That'll give you more self-control. That's what you're at. That's what you're wanting. Oh, I could hug you. I could just hug you if I could reach through the screen. So in terms of um, the emotion, emotional intelligence, which you're absolutely, not only has your own journey given you experience in that, but you're also a PhD. So no doubt you're an expert in the emotional intelligence of humans. Tell us how how do we um, how do we learn to understand ourselves better? How do we how do we become more aware and more connected with ourselves so that we can notice these things? Because I think awareness is fifty percent of the battle won. Yet most of us are not even in the fight. How do well, we? The way we stay connected to ourselves, Karen, is by staying connected to what we feel emotionally, which we also feel has it is a physical component to our emotions. So the better we are at staying in touch with what we feel on a moment-to-moment -moment basis throughout the day, the more self-knowledge and self-understanding we'll have. The toolkit also has a skill for developing this ability. Right. Most people who don't know what they feel emotionally throughout the day at any given time have, have had experiences that have frightened them and, and put them, you know, made them afraid of what they feel. The truth of the matter is that feelings can't hurt us. Again, they, they really protect us. They're part of what keeps us alive. But we have to learn how to manage them and be comfortable with them. It's our fear of them that creates so much stress mm. that we get into trouble. It's the stress that gets us into trouble, not the raw emotion itself. So I've created a, a process. It's a meditative process for learning how to stay connected to what you feel, even when you feel frightened. That's the key, because it's very easy to be in kind of a here and now, meditative, nice place, as long as we're safe and comfortable. Yeah, true. But once, but once we feel threatened, usually that just, well, it's gone. Yeah. We don't have yeah. it anymore. And so, and, and of course, what happens when we lose our ability to be aware of what we feel, and we move into that fight, flight, or freeze reflex response, that's when we say and do things 
that we often regret. Mm. So mm. this is a way of staying in in touch with yourself. Uh, I I think I don't mind the word control. I want to be in control of myself. Well, I think everybody uh, does. We all want to know that we are controlling this vehicle. Because this is the vehicle that creates. This is the vehicle that relates. This is the vehicle that, you know, has us experience the world. Jeannie, how did, how did you come to realize that we needed this information? Well, years ago, I was part of a group that worked with cancer patients at UCLA. This is like 40 years ago. I mean, a long time ago. And we were developing, um, really, the, the whole basis of holistic health right. was something right. that we were dabbling with at the time. It, was, it really wasn't even well known. It was just beginning, sort of the bud. And that we had some, we, uh, at UCLA, they gave us patients that they f- had done everything for. They felt that they, there was, they called them in those days, they don't use this term anymore, I'm happy about. They called them terminal. They had three to 18 months to live, so they would let us have them and work with them. And it was very surprising. It was not a a large group that survived, but among these very sickest people, and and the the science at the time was pretty primitive, there was a group that survived for more than seven years, okay, with a life expectancy of no more than a year and a half. Right. So I was in charge of a group that, that tried to, you know, ask the question: well, What? How come these people are making it? What's going on here? How are they? How are they able to survive such a serious threat? And it took us a couple of years. I mean, we just hit one wall after another. But finally, someone, one of the graduate students, gave everybody and uh, the whole center uh, a standard uh, psychological test, the MMPI. It's still around. It's just a classic old test. Yeah. And dark on that our the, uh, what we called our survivors, had a different profile than the rest of the group. And what was this profile? Number one, the people who were our quote-unquote survivors were people who identified a full range of feelings. They said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm and remember, this is like in the 60s, so it wasn't like okay for women to get mad or men to be scared. But the men in this, you know, answered, yeah, I, I get scared. And the women said, I get mad. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. I get mad, I get sad, I get frightened, I feel joy. You know, I have, I have a full range of feelings and I feel them throughout the day, number one. Number two, it's okay. There were people who said, I recognize feelings, but especially given the times, some feelings were not okay. So if I felt scared or I felt angry or, you know, that wasn't okay. The third characteristic of our, quote, survivors were that they used the, their emotional understanding in their decision-making process. Oh, uh, that, wow. So, so if they had a doctor, for example, an oncologist, that they did really, every time they went to have a visit, they got upset. They just had a bad, you know, it was a bad experience again mm-hmm. and again. They found another equally qualified doctor that they liked. Yeah. That, that made a huge difference. People were, it isn't, they were just basing their decisions on their feelings. Mm. But they mm. listened to their feelings and it was part of their decision making process. So that at that point I said, Whoa. Um, and I said to myself, gee, I don't do that. Yeah. Duh. <laughs> you know, why don't I? Yeah. And so I yeah. started examining what what keeps us from doing that if it's so important. And I, I think it is. And more and more evidence. In the 90s, we actually started to see how the brain really works. And it turns out, a la emotional intelligence, that the biggest part of who we are, what we, what motivates us, what um, really has to do with the choices we make, and the things that we actually do come from the emotional parts of the brain. Mm. We yes. can lose the whole frontal lobe of the brain and still remain, retain our personality. Yeah. If we lose the emotional parts of the brain, we, as we understand ourselves, are, no longer exist. So it's a very important part of the brain. <laughs> so tell us now, Jeannie, you've written a book, um, Feeling Loved. Tell us about that book and also tell um, our listeners and our viewers as to how they can get their hands on a copy of it because I know that 
you're just going to be inundated with orders on this because your information today has been nothing short of exceptional. So tell us about the book and how we can get it. Well, let me tell you first about the, the, the concept of feeling loved. And we've talked about, I've, I've mentioned a couple times already about how when we have someone who looks at us who, in a face-to-face -face connection, who looks at us like they value us with this sense, you know, we look at them and we can see that they, they like, you know, they accept us. When we have that sense of acceptance from another face of, that, of being valued, we have such social brains. Again, this has to do with what we've learned about the social emotional brain. Mm -hmm. Our brains are so, that, that's like the best thing our brain can have. That yeah. is brain candy. Yeah, that is like, right. That, that really fills us up. When we see a face looking into our face with caring admiration, you know, that, those, that's what feels good. That's what feels love. And now, you've written a I, lot about that in the book as well. It's, that's right. And that's fabulous. I the, right. I make the distinction between many of us know that we're loved. Mm -hmm. You know, we were told we're loved. We logically know that our, this one loves us, that one loves us. Yeah. But you know yeah. what? When we don't get that nonverbal communication that happens in this face-to-face -face communication, it's not about words. It's about how it's the nonverbal communication that happens when we see people looking at us in a certain way, using a certain tone of voice yeah. with us. Yeah. Just that it's that that makes us feel loved. And that feeling yeah. is yeah. the most, um, it's the greatest antidote to stress yeah. that there yeah. is. And I love how you talk about that in the book where you talk about how to feel it, but then also how to express it. And it may indeed be that, you know, you started the program earlier by saying that there's a sense of, of wanting to stuff ourselves. Maybe, I, I would say that one of the things that we hunger most for, hunger for, mm. is mm. this feeling, it, which is a, a feeling of, of love. Love and acceptance. from I this agree. kind of communication. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So how can our listeners and our viewers get their hands on a copy of your book, Jeannie? They can get they can get it online on any bookstore. There are several bookstores in uh, in Australia. I know that I've, I've sent you a couple of, of uh, links to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they can get it. They can get it in book form uh, as a paperback, or they can also get it online. You know, as an ebook. So um, as an ebook, so online and ask for feeling love, and you'll get it. And you'll find it. So all the normal outlets, the Amazons, the fish ponds, yeah. all the normal oh. outlets online. Right. Awesome. So, it's all over the place. Great. Jeannie, thank you for the message that you bring to the world and thank you for your tenacious energy behind making sure that we all get this understanding and this comprehension of who we are and how our nervous system is actually in, at the driving force. Thank you for putting so much energy into that because I think now more than ever, as you, as you say and believe, it's that it's more important for us as humans because we are overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed and we don't know what to do with ourselves. And people like you who are blazing a trail for us, give us a path to follow and turn the lights on for us where we can't see sometimes. So thank you for being that for me personally. And thank you for being that for all of our viewers and all of our listeners today. It's been an absolute honor to share the couch with you. So again, thank you very, very much for joining us. My pleasure, Karen. So for everybody who's watched this show and enjoyed the company as I have with Jeannie, I certainly hope that you've gotten as much as I have, but it doesn't end here. Please don't let it end with this show. Go to the links below this video. Get your hands on a copy of Jeannie's book, Feeling Loved, and also make sure that you go to the toolkit and also check out helpguide.org. It's bookmarked on my iPad. It's bookmarked on all of my computers because there is so much valuable information. So make sure that you go and continue the journey, continue the ride. As Jeannie said, it, from here on in, it's an exploration. Take excitement. Be, be energized. Be enthused by the exploration that now sits before you. I know I certainly am, and I'm not going to use my overeating or my emotional eating as a stick to beat myself up with anymore. Now I'm going to use it as a platform to launch me into greater self-control. 
join me on the ride and I'll see you and on Karen's Corner in just a minute. Thanks again, Jeannie. Welcome. And right here, right now, you're here with me on Karen's Corner. Now, we've just done an episode on emotional eating, so I thought it was a perfect opportunity for me to introduce you to my antidote to emotional eating. Because, you know, when we eat, it's really important that it feels like a reward, and it really is important that we feel like there's a lot of love in it. And I, I do that with my breakfast. I love myself a lot when I'm having my breakfast. I also want to tell you guys that one of our primary sponsors is Maya. And today, I just happen to be wearing the gorgeous, fabulous Jane Lamerton. Now, you were asking and wondering what I was wearing when I was doing the interview. I know you were, so I thought I'd better tell you. So let's get on with it. Let me tell you guys what I've discovered with what I've got here on the table. Over to my far left, I have the Thermi. Absolutely love my Thermi. I'm a devotee, would not miss my Thermi for anything. I've had Thermi for about two and a half, possibly three years. Now the Thermomix is probably one of the best blenders on the market and the best machines on the market. It's a kitchen appliance, it's not a blender, it's not a machine, it's so much more than that. Now the, the Thermomix has the capacity to cook because it has a heating element in it and it also has a blade inside or a motor inside that's as powerful as an aeroplane engine. So as soon as you put anything in there dry or wet, it whips it and blends it and grinds it to whatever you need it to with ease. The Thermomix also comes with a steaming component and it also comes with a, a drainer, which you can also use as a rice bucket that sits inside the, the metal bowl here. So I've used the Thermomix to within an inch of my life. Still, I probably use it three or four times a day. I cook my curries, I make my own curry sauces, I make everything in there, lemonades, ice cream, the lot. Matt loves Thermi. Can't use it, but loves it. Now what happened when I decided to go vegan last year, the Thermi came in really handy because I could still make all of my own vegetable-based and plant-based foods. But this year, I started flirting with being raw vegan and I lost about six kilos, never felt better. But what I found with the Thermomix, it felt like it was a bit of overkill in terms of the heating component in it. So I went out and did some cooking classes, although you wouldn't call them cooking classes. It's a raw, mas raw food masterclass is what they're called. So I went and did a raw food masterclass and the instructor had a Vitamix. Now when I watched him use the Vitamix, I watched him put everything into it and blend everything. What I saw come out of this machine was amazing. And what I loved about it was that I could actually see what was going on inside of the bowl. So after we did the class, I asked him if he knew about Thermomix and what the comparison was. He was a real advocate for Vitamix. And if I didn't have Thermi, I probably would have just gone out and bought the Vitamix. But because I've already spent $2,000 on this little puppy over here, I had to think clearly and carefully about what I was gonna do next. So I started doing research on Vitamix. And then as soon as I started doing research here, the Optimum popped up. And now there's real competition because now I'm looking at another machine and if you look at them, they look very similar. But there are some very subtle differences to both of the machines and I'm gonna show you what they are. Um, but I can honestly say to you, having used both of these machines for the last four weeks in my home, I've done ice creams, I've done smoothies, I've done um, grinding nuts, I've done rice milks, I've done everything in them. They are both exceptional machines and I can't tell you that one is better than the other. So I'm not going to, because that just would be a lie. So what I'm gonna share with you guys here right really quickly is we've got the Vitamix. Now the Vitamix is a really sturdy jug with the rubber handle. Underneath, it has a plastic mechanism around the blade and there are four blades inside the jug. These blades run at, I'm just gonna to refer to my notes here, at 1500 watts of power. So pretty much anything that you put inside of this machine, it's gonna eat it up for breakfast. It's got um, uh, the pulse mechanism to it and it's also got the ability to increase the speed of the blade. So if you don't wanna pulverize something into within an inch of its life, you just keep it on a slightly lower speed. But everything with the, with the Vitamix is super compact 
and super convenient. I've actually found myself traveling with both of these machines because I can simply stick this into my, uh, my check-in baggage because it's got the blades and the, the mechanism doesn't detach like the Thermomix does, but these don't. So um, I stick this into my check-in baggage and if I want to carry this on with me, which I actually do, it's light enough to do that. It's somewhere between three and a half and five kilos at best. So it's really light. So that's the, that's the Vitamix. Really awesome, super convenient, watertight, nothing leaks, really brilliant. Come across to the Optimum, it's a slightly, slightly lighter unit. The jug is a similar shape, and what I've discovered is it's the shape of the, dr of the jug, the drug, I nearly said the drug. It's the safe shape of the jug that forces the food to be sucked downwards and then um, do some really amazing blending. Inside of the Optimum, we've got six blades inside there and we've got a metal mechanism so um, but yet the jug is a little lighter so in terms of power the optimum is 2200 watts of power blending your food really awesome as soon as you put anything in here you even on the low uh, on the low speed dials because you'll see that the the mechanisms are relatively similar on the front but the low speed dials even on the low speed dials it annihilates anything that you put in there and the beautiful thing about both of these machines is they they burst the outside enzymes of your raw food which releases the nutrients so you're able to have raw foods with ease and be, and it's really, really healthy, but you don't lose any of the flavor. And you also don't find, um, because it does the blending so quickly in both of the machines, it doesn't heat the food up. So I can put my ice, I can put my frozen berries, whatever I want in there, and it doesn't heat it and melt it. So what I thought I'd do is for you guys, I'm gonna make my breakfast. This is what I normally do. And when I'm making breakfast, it's time for me. Throughout the day and the night, I'm flat out. I don't have time to even think or scratch myself, much less even go to the bathroom. But when it comes to breakfast time, that's my time. So I put a lot of love into cutting everything up. I put a lot of love into making my coconut milk and coconut water concoction, soaking my chia seeds. I use a beautiful um, high potency vitamin C from my very, very best friend, Cindy O'Meara. I also have um, a protein powder, which I haven't brought with me today, but I use a, a protein powder, powder called Inca Inchi, and that goes into my smoothies as well as some berries. So let's check it out and see how both of the blenders work when it comes to grinding or blending apples, celery tops. Don't screw your nose up, it's nice, trust me. Cucumber. Chia seeds, throw a bit of those in. This is all very cool, very handful of my berries, frozen berries, not too many, I don't need too much. And then to wet it all down, my beautiful concoction of coconut water and coconut milk. And this is what gives it the beautiful rich flavor, which I love, but you could use just coconut water if you wanted to, or you could use plain water, you can do whatever you want. And I'm not saying that I'm, an, I'm a legend when it comes to nutrition. I'm learning. I'm a work in progress. So if you don't like my recipe, that's okay. There's plenty on the internet that you can find for yourself. What I would say, always throw green. If you're going to have a smoothie, always put green in it because it's beautifully alkalizing and refreshing and it sets the body up for a really, um, a really healthy day ahead. So I'll throw a bit of those in. Now, I don't have a teaspoon with me here on the table and I don't want to put my chunky chia seed spoon into my beautiful uh, vitamin C camu camu, so I'm not going to put that in right now, but you can just imagine that I have if you like. Now, both of these machines, I'll say to you, are quieter than the Thermomix. They're not as loud. So when the Thermomix goes, everybody in the house knows that I'm having breakfast. But, but with both of these machines, they're a little bit quieter. So here we go. Watch and be amazed. And they both have, by the way, they both have these tampers. So just in case the food gets stuck, you shove the tamper in and it pushes it down onto the blade. So we might have to do that. I'm not sure if I've put enough liquid in, but we'll soon see. All right, ready? Here we go. I'm starting both of the machines off on low speed and then I'm gonna wind them up to a higher speed. So here we go. So that's the low speed. And you can see it's already sucking all of the food in 
and bringing it into a blend. Now I'm going to turn that right up. Didn't need to use the tamper. So I'm only at half speed right now. That's the pulse button that I just pressed there. So that's looking really smooth and gorgeous. Now let's have a look at the optimum. Make sure that I'm pushing the right button here. Okay, so now that is on its lowest speed and you can see it's already sucked the food through. It's a little bit louder, the optimum. two sensational smoothies. So our production team have been turning their nose up as I've been making this green smoothie, but they're all going to have a bit. They're all going to have some. So as you can see, you know, the beautiful thing that I love about this too, it hasn't splashed up all over the lid. So the cleaning up afterwards, it's not a chore. For both of the machines, the cleaning up is an absolute breeze. All you do is you pop a little bit of um, hot water or warm water into the machines with a little bit of soap, blend the hot water and it cleans the blades. It's absolutely brilliant. Not dishwasher safe, neither of them. So you're gonna see this is super, super smooth. Super smooth, no lumps, no bumps, really gorgeous. And this is my view on it. I love the Thermomix, and you know that I do, but when it comes to blending raw foods, the Thermomix still leaves lumps. Doesn't matter how hard I blend it or how long I blend it for, it's still quite fibrous and quite lumpy. These smoothies are silky, silky smooth, and there's no lumps and there's no chewing. And that's really, when you're looking at raw foods and you know, uh, raw smoothies, you really wanna make sure that you're, you're getting it broken down as much as you can for your own digestion. Again, no mess, how easy is that? So I'll pour this one out and you can see again, no lumps, no bumps, just beautifully smooth. And it's exactly the same if you wanted to make an ice cream. All you do is you throw frozen bananas in with your frozen berries, bit of coconut milk, some coconuts, some cashews, whatever you want to, throw it in and both of these machines will whip it into the smoothest, creamiest and most delightful ice creams. So I say chin chin. I hope you've enjoyed the, the um, review today. I can't differentiate between either of these machines. So what I actually decided to do was I spoke to Optimum and I'm selling Optimum on my website. Go to the shop and you can pick up one of these machines if you want to. Um, let me just tell you about the price. These are around 470 when they're on special but 895 when they're not. Um, and the Optimum is around about the 799 mark but I have seen them on the marketplace for a little bit cheaper than that as well. Uh, sorry, the Vitamix, I have seen them um, a little bit cheaper than that. But I can honestly say to you, I've reviewed both of them and I've reviewed them from the point of view of making sure that I get really good quality results and I can't separate them. They're awesome. So in my kitchen, I now have three machines. Chin chin. Enjoy your breakfast and I'll see you on Karen's Couch next week. Bye for now. Mm. Oh. Yum. Yum. Oh, stop it. You have to try it, you guys. Get out of town. Work it, baby, work it! Well done, alright.